A very warm welcome to everybody to this um, COVID version of the Global Enterprise Experience. Um, it's been a rapid learning curve since one o'clock this afternoon to be able to convert this to an online event. Um, but here we are, and here we go, and one of the joys of this is that we've managed to send out to the 1,360 participants around the world saying, you don't have to fly to New Zealand, you can join us. So a very, very welcome, hi re mai, to both those of you who are here in New Zealand and those who are joining us from overseas. Um, I'd like to give my thanks to our host, and he was going to host us in Parliament, but he's hosting us for this event tonight, the Honourable Dr David Clark, who's the Minister of Digital Edu Economy and Communications, hugely relevant to this contest, state-owned enterprises, because, you know, we've got coaching involved and in how do we grow these innovative organisations that can be world-changing, and he's got a few other hats as well, and I haven't listed them all, but Minister, thank you very much for... Um, both hosting us and pivoting to an online event. I'd also like to thank Victoria University of Wellington. This is, um, you can see in the background Parliament where we're supposed to be in Victoria University where we, uh, many of our students are studying. They have been the principal sponsor of this event for 18 years. And this year we had 92 students. Some of them were part of a Management 317 ahead as a part of a course and some of them are volunteers just growing as leaders so to all of you a warm thank you and I'd also like to thank the University of Otago Business School that they're a sponsor and they put on 79 students this year and what's magic about them is we say look we've had so many enrollments how many of you would like to lead so we had big numbers of Otago students were leading global teams this year along with um University of Sussex, uh, Nottingham in the UK, um, uh, Mammoth in uh, Ireland, the uh, Kathmandu University of Management in Nepal, uh, the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, um, and Alliant University in its America, all offered uh, leaders who stepped up to say, yep, they're going to take on the challenge. So that's been fantastic. Now, I was going to wear this beautiful Māori um, uh, korowai, it's a cloak. It was gifted for winning the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations and BMW Group's Intercultural Innovation Award because we're about being successful and growing leaders for a future world. And this year has been no exception. In fact, there's um, been such large numbers uh, this year. So, you know, what are we about? How do we have leaders to solve world issues? The big stuff, climate change and refugees and plastics pollution and all these things I read about in the 168 uh, proposals that came in. How do we build cross-cultural relationships and partnerships? Not just relationships, but how do we genuinely work in partnership? And here in New Zealand, we, you know, it's a slow process, but we're finally learning what does it mean to really be in partnership with Indigenous peoples and others who come to this country? And how can we use business as a way for self-sustaining solutions? So rather than demanding that government and aid agencies cough up, how can we as individuals change the world, do it sustainably by making a profit? So this year, for those who are, who are guests and haven't um, um, battled your way through this experience, um, there were teams of eight across different worldviews and cultures and time zones. So, um, and so those teams had to work together to develop a six page business concept proposal for a profitable venture that fosters a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. And they had to do it with limited capital. We didn't say exactly how limited, but we did say we've got $4,000 for the winner, but you had to find a way to make it happen. So, um, you know, really tough challenge. But part of the point behind the limited capital was to say, let's not make this a theoretical exercise. Let's make this about what does it take to, for you to actually make it happen and imagine yourselves doing it, and for many of you to step in and actually doing it. So this year we had uh, 1,800 uh, enrollments, of which we knocked it down to 1,360. These are the countries that participated. There were 200 universities and organizations, and they came from 55 countries this year. And then the, the teams required at the outset to find a way to talk to each other. And they did. They used uh, 47 technologies this year. 
So there's a bunch there and more technologies and more technologies and more technologies. And can I let you know that almost none of those technologies work in China? And yet we had 120 students from China. So the teams that had Chinese in, in their, um, in the leaders of the Chinese and their teams had to be very creative and find ways to be able to communicate with China and the rest of the world. It was just one more little extra challenge because there really weren't, weren't enough challenges going before that. So, so all of these folks from different parts of the world, teams of eight, had to work in unity and jointly develop some creative solutions. So what we did was we, we uh, had some leaders uh, for those who are not in New Zealand, this is one of our famous rugby players who was uh, the captain of the All Blacks when they won almost all of their matches for nearly a decade. Um, so, you know, he's one of our favoured leaders. But we assigned leaders to teams and we trained some of these leaders beforehand. And then some belatedly, um, just before the start, said, yep, we need an extra 86 leaders, please help. So we quickly provided some training for them. And then about another 80-odd students who stepped up during the contest and said, I'm taking a leadership role. And for most of those, we managed to add them into the platforms of training and support and coaching. Not everyone. We didn't catch them, all of them, until the, uh, after the end. And these are people we call peer leaders. Every single person in this contest is expected to be a peer leader. Everybody is jointly responsible for the team's creativity and productivity and performance, for decision making and for unity and for helping others to succeed. And some of people in this contest really stepped up. And to those who did, I want to tell you that being a peer leader is many ways harder than being a leader. When there's a problem and when you say, that's me, I'm going to step up without the hat, without the authority, without all of the reasons why people should look to you. Um, and of course, I've got this wonderful photo of Greta here who did just that. Look at the power of this young girl who said, there's a problem, I'm going to take some action. So part of this contest is how do all of us see what needs to be done and step up and make a difference. And my deepest, deepest admiration to those in the teams who were just phenomenal peer leaders. And some were invited, some had a problem, some stepped up, some managed with some really difficult circumstances. And then this year we had these leader coaches and we reached out to, many of them were, were leaders from previous uh, years, they, they knew about the G um, and had been very, very successful in past years, so over the last 18 years. Some of them uh, we got through the Council for International Development. Um, some of them uh, we got through the United Nations uh, Association New Zealand. Some of them we got through IPANS, which is about growing leaders for the public sector. And we trained up these, uh, these coaches and 44 of them went on to coach. And those 44 gifted 500 hours of personal coaching to our leaders. Um, and I've just been reading the, uh, my 317's coaching assignment and I tell you what, it, gosh, it makes your heart sing, the, the, the profound impact that people have when they say, I need to coach others and find a way to hear and listen and uplift others to succeed. So my deepest gratitude to our coaches as well. Um, so this is about social entrepreneurship. How do you have a social and environmental impact and make enough profit to be self-sustaining? And we also want to grow our people to be people who make ideas happen. And my gosh, it takes courage. And when we looked at the new venture award, we we're finding the ones who would go over that waterfall just like that saying, right, let me go. I'm going to make it happen. I have the courage to make decisions and to act. So we got your 168 proposals. We've got a, um, a thousand um, uh, reflections. And Gina and I and, and some others read through these um, and we've got some colleagues to get it down to the best ones. And it went out to our phenomenal judges. So I'd like to firstly thank mm. these judges, the Right Honourable Helen Clark. Um, she was Prime Minister of New Zealand, a remarkable Prime Minister for nine years. And she's also head of the United Nations Development Programme for eight years. And she's currently um, 
responsible for looking for the United Nations at COVID. So huge responsibilities. And yet she she was finding time for looking at your work. So congratulations on that. Grant McPherson is the Chief Executive Officer of the Education New Zealand. It's a multi-billion dollar business to New Zealand. Came to a bit of a screeching halt with COVID and we're about to rebuild with power to uh, to find ways to engage with the rest of the world to, um, with, uh, with export education. Giselle Weybrook is a special advisor of the United Nations Global Compact, and she's working with 700 universities around the world on how to bring the responsible, principles of responsible management education. Thank you, Giselle. And thank you to James Lord, who's the manager for workforce leadership um, with uh, Taitura, they just changed their name, they were called Solgam, and they're responsible for all the leadership development for our 93 local uh, authorities here in New Zealand. So huge thanks to our five judges for the work that you've done. And sorry, my fifth judge, Rebecca Stephens-Smith, she's head of scholarships improvement for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, did an absolutely sterling job, and has previous experience at actually understanding about social enterprises. And I also want to pass out a special thanks to our chief coach, to Anelda Mayo. She gifted 160 hours of coaching time to our coaches, plus uh, presenting and designing up our coaching program. So again, a remarkable achievement of gifted time. Thank you, Anelda, you're, you're a complete star. So Minister, can I hand over to you now, please, for, uh, for your insights and thoughts uh, for our audience here on the Global Enterprise Experience. Kia ora, e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā karanga maha o tu a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou nā uh, katoa. A ki ngā na, mana whenua, ko uh, Taranaki Whanui, Te Ateawa, ko Ngāti Tōranga Tira, uh, tēnā koutou. Nō kutu hona rei, kia haere mai ki te whakanuia tēnei huihui ngā whakahirehira. Nō reira, ngā manaki tanga, ki runga, i a tātou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, can I uh, welcome you all uh, virtually to the Parliament? Um, we are all uh, a little more socially distanced here than we were uh, 24 hours ago, and uh, what a difference a day makes. Um, can I acknowledge from the outset, uh, Deb, your leadership of this program and facilitation with your team of uh, a virtual event at very short notice as uh, Wellington uh, scrambles to make sure that it does the best by its citizens in keeping uh, COVID at bay. Can I acknowledge uh, those who've taken an interest in the program, the judges you've just introduced, um, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, those with uh, foreign affairs, UN uh, and education connections, um, ambassadors who've taken an interest, um, representatives from Victoria University, uh, Otago University, of course, the business school, actually down just down the road where I live, um, universities, I, you know, UK, USA, uh, and uh, South Africa, um, and around the world, such a global interest in this program. Uh, can I congratulate you and thank you and welcome you uh, to this uh, event today? Um, look, growing ethical leaders is such an important thing for our country, and it's such an important thing for the world. And uh, as I understand the program, that's one of the the very real outcomes from your ethic efforts. Um, international connections are a driver of productivity um, and the global enterprise experience um, builds connections, uh, connects New Zealanders with the world and, and the world with New Zealand uh, and you all with each other. And we know that experiential learning, getting out there and doing things, uh, making those connections and sharing the lessons is crucial for uh, lifting the capacity of all who are involved. Um, the experiences and skills you will have developed through this uh, program will, um, and in bringing um, your skills to bear on real global challenges across borders, um, will uh, benefit others. Um, and I trust you too will take something away from it. It will be something uh, that helps with the transformation of our countries to better understand the opportunities and the digital context and how we can uh, best use it to create sustainable, inclusive, uh, prosperous and peaceful communities. Um, as the Minister of Digital Economy and Communications, um, it is delightful to see a program like this able to be delivered online. And indeed, uh, now also an awards ceremony 
um, delivered online as an added bonus um, if we're looking for the silver linings here. Uh, this shows just what is possible uh, when there's a will. Um, and I'm sure you will all have stories about how this technology has enabled you uh, as a team to connect with people who may have different views and perspectives. And also at times the technology uh, will have been frustrating. And uh, I know we all need a mixture of both. Um, but building a, a global team and global networks uh, takes courage and persistence and can I acknowledge that uh, in all of you in your efforts? I mean, 55 countries, 1,360 participants. Uh, I think I heard you say, uh, Deb, 168 proposals. Um, this is a really significant program. Um, previously, I myself have had the experience of uh, an overseas um, uh, fellowship called an Eisenhower Fellowship in the United States of America, which sought to build connections across uh, a range of countries present uh, and I've seen the way in which um, that program, which was in 2013, uh, the connections have remained from people from 21 different countries, uh, all of whom uh, have leadership roles in their own countries in one way or another, and all of whom are committed to a more peaceful and prosperous uh, world into the future. Those connections built through a program like this have lasting impacts on our own lives, but also on the communities around us. And I've seen that uh, in education programs being rolled out in, in friends and connections being made beyond the, the original program uh, for the benefit of educational outcomes and actually contributing towards things that are included in the sustainable development goals. I've also seen in my own community, uh, a small program on campus at Otago University called P3 being set up again to implement sustainable development goals uh, where volunteers come together and compete uh, again in a not-for-profit uh, way to try and implement goals. And I've seen the impacts there. Uh, winners going on to set up renewable power schemes in the Pacific Islands. So, um, and, and those who uh, have simply participated, going away and taking their ideas and making the world a better place without even the winnings or the capital, um, applying the learnings from the program and the connect and building on the connections they've built through those experiences. Um, part of my job uh, as the local uh, minister responsible for digital economy is to build a strategy so that New Zealand itself uh, begins to look at how it can maximise uh, the benefits of being online uh, for its citizens. And um, to, to share a little of that, uh, we're looking at how we can build on an Indigenous uh, model, looking at um, the, the kind of way in which trust is built, what we're calling mahi tika, uh, mahi tahi, the, the working together and the benefits of including everybody in our success, uh, and mahi ake, looking at the, the productivity gains from, from a digital world. Now, I'm sure those will be some of the same things that you'll be looking at in your programs, uh, and I congratulate you as you have employed some of those concepts, no doubt, in the projects that you have uh, developed through your work. Um, so I don't want to say much more because the exciting awards lie ahead, but I do want to congratulate you, to thank you for the volunteering that's been involved in this program, to thank you for being willing to put yourselves forward and out there uh, in, in a competition uh, where your efforts uh, are open to challenge from peers, from colleagues in other countries. Uh, they're looked at by judges uh, and people will be sharing that whole time their own experiences, which others will benefit from. But you've put yourselves forward, you've taken a risk, You've chosen to get involved uh, in a program that aims to make the world a better place. So can I congratulate you all? Can I congratulate tonight's winners ahead of time? Uh, but a special congratulations to everybody who has participated uh, and thank you to the organisers. I wish you all the very best uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and to be a part of this evening's celebrations. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Kia ora, Minister. Thank you very much for uh, your wonderful words there. Uh, we appreciate you hosting us and your, your uh, contribution towards building the kind of society that we all wish to live in. So I just want to talk about some of the participants and who they are and why they're taking part. So Jamshid Khan Shinwari is from Afghanistan, and he stepped up to be a co-leader during this contest. And he was talking with the other leaders. And he said, well, it's a bit hard in Afghanistan at the moment. We have 93 deaths a day in Kabul. Um, and he said, my job it, with my colleagues is to not deal with the politics, but to build from the bottom up a kind of society. And he's trying to work on 30, uh, 80 different social enterprises to make a difference. 
that I can't give her full name. This is Huda from Iran. She's one of the five Iranian Baha'is that we had, um, and they're studying at a, a university called the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. And this is an underground university that gets raided and shut down, and its professors imprisoned. They imprisoned uh, one of the professors for um, he had about for twenty years. Um, and one of our students uh, that we had in the global enterprise experience got imprisoned for five years for the crimes of uh, communicating with foreigners and an association with this Baha'i Institute of Education. So the very things that we are celebrating the people achieving tonight are the very things that Hoda and her four colleagues um, uh, get imprisoned for. Hoda, um, she was rated as the most valuable member of her team. She really stood up. Uh, stepped up but you know it was very difficult for her and then we had um, uh, Ashma Sharma from Nepal and she uh, volunteered to lead a team and uh, the Nepalis I have to tell you are just magic I I don't know they cope with incredible hardships and they seem to never complain and this year two days in they um, two days in some years ago they had an 8.2 earthquake and 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 uh, never complained and found a way to con contribute this time they go into COVID lockdown and somehow they still staunchly just make it all happen. So she was one of 89 Nepali who was remarkable. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ana Maria Bustamante Londono and she's from Colombia and we had 60 Colombians. Um, they had a month of rioting. Um, some issues about how to raise the taxes to pay for COVID and so forth. And many of them were housebound because it was too dangerous to go out. Now, Ana Maria did something interesting. She powered ahead and she got all this work done, but she left the team in her wake. And then she realized that actually performance is half the story, but building the team and getting everybody to contribute is the other half. And she went back with the leader of her team and said, come on, let's rebuild this team. And but it, it finished in, in true cohesion with all team members uh, working in hand in hand and feeling really united. It was an interesting transformation. Um, let me talk about one of my 81 Management 317 students. Jean Tablanche was, um, uh, he, <laughs> He was an enthusiastic gene, he's just a real character. And he said, that's it, we have daily meetings. And he went from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. every night for three weeks to be able to make sure that the teams um, um, contributed fully. So now I'd like to, um, Gina Cranwinkle, she's part of our organization, uh, Wind Eaters. She's a senior consultant with us. She helped us to, um, to, um, uh, to get the, the, the proposals down to the best ones that went out to the um, to our external judges. And so, as I said, we had 1,800 enrollments and 1,360 who com uh, competed, of whom 999 completed everything. The reflection, the name on the team report, did the 360-degree feedback. And Jean, uh, we invite you up to the stage to take the awards from the minister and Gina, but we're going to do it virtually, you know, you, you get the general idea as to how this, this works. So um, um, Gina, um, <laughs> Gina's got a problem. She's been looking at all these proposals and there was one that won um, three years ago and we only had a thousand dollars to give to it. And it was in Burundi, which is the world's most food insecure country. And they were make, taking the cabbages and they were trying to turn them into sauerkraut so that um, um, the cabbages were, didn't rot and they lasted for longer, but they didn't have enough money to buy this machine to actually convert them into sauerkraut. So Gina stepped in and added some money for that. Well, now she's been reading all these other proposals going, oh, I want to fund so many, I want to make them all happen. So let's hope that there may be other kind souls out there that would also like to support some of these amazing proposals. Now, Trey, I think I saw that you have managed to arrive. Trey is one of our uh, Management 317 students. He was a leader of a team. I asked if he would share the student experience. And he was driving down from a remote a little town in New Zealand with his parents, got halfway to Wellington and heard the news that COVID, after 15 months of nothing here, has finally struck Wellington. 
and drove all the way back. And I said, well, I don't know if he's going to get back in time. But the good news is, if I saw correctly, he has. So, Trey, can I pass over to you, please? Uh, kia ora. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, tēnā koutou i tēnei ai ai. Ka tangi te tīte, ka tangi te kākā, ka tangi hoki a hau. Tīhe Māori ora. Ko tāki tamu te waka, ko mau mau kai te maunga, ko ngāti kahungunu te iwi. Nō nua kā hau. Nō reira tēnā koutou kātō. Kia ora. My name is Trey Christie and I was part of the 1,360 participants in this year's Global Enterprise Experience. Earlier this year, we all signed up for a paper called Innovation and Change at Victoria University. And to be honest, no one knew what to expect. It was sprung upon us that we would all be global leaders in the Global Enterprise Experience, and we would each be entirely responsible for producing a six-page business concept proposal. Deb made sure we knew the risk involved. Then other team, other team members um, typically bike 40 kilometers each day only to reach internet access and others quite literally, as you heard, sacrifice their freedom. For us, this was nothing but a school project, but for others, this was obviously much more. April 21st came around the corner and all of a sudden I was leading a group of people from very different parts of the world. The Netherlands, Nigeria, South Africa, Malaysia, Thailand, Nepal, and the strangest place of all, Dunedin. Everyone had different levels of education. There were cultural differences, language barriers, different societal norms, and totally different perspectives on life. I was terrified. Managing eight people from different parts of the world was not as simple as we thought it would be. My strategy for managing the proposal was simple. Identify everyone's strengths, understand their values, and make sure no one was doing something they did not want to do. Our one team quickly became three groups. We had a business overview group, a financial group, and a marketing group, each of set tasks and objectives. And to be honest, the team made my job so much easier. However, this was not really the case for everyone else. Some people had team members quit halfway through. Some people had team members not respond at all. And others had team members attempt a coup to overthrow them. At times like these, I found the use of personal coaches to be crucial. These coaches allowed me to critically reflect on my thoughts, on my feelings, on our processes, and on our sheer goals, which ultimately allowed me to make better decisions. Towards the end of the three weeks, my days would not finish until around 3 a.m. I was tired, I was grumpy, and I was developing a problematic caffeine addiction. I felt like I had the problem of the world on my shoulders. But after connecting with my team on a deep and a more meaningful level, they began to open up and I began to realize that my problems weren't really problems at all. After 21 days, we finally finished our proposal. I remember vividly the smile on everyone's faces in our Zoom call, especially the smile from my new Nigerian friend, Kenny. It was Kenny's idea we chose to develop, and for Kenny, GEE has made his idea a reality. For him, this experience holds something of real value, and I believe we have made a large impact on Kenny's life. Referring back to the Māori whakatauki I spoke in the beginning, a common translation is, the TT speaks, the kaka speaks, and I have something to say too. For me, and I hope for many of my peers, this reflects our time throughout this experience. Personally, I have begun to find my voice, and this experience has encouraged me to use it. So to Deb, sponsors, coaches, and everyone else involved, on behalf of the 1,360 participants, 
I would like to say thanks. I would like to finish by leaving my peers with a little bit of advice I once heard from an old man. Whatever it is you choose to do in life, whether it be sport, entertainment, education, or most importantly, politics, make sure you go into it fired with enthusiasm. Because if you don't, you should expect to be fired with enthusiasm. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you so much for, uh, for that presentation. Uh, uh, great, my, wonderful. Really appreciate that. So let me share my screen again. So let's have a look at the Global Leader Awards. This was an award for impressive leadership. Um, and it was really impressive leadership. It was really amazing. Um, they had to receive not just good feedback from their teammates for this award, but glowing feedback, and they did. They had to write a reflection, and the reflection had to, you know, there's a humility about it, saying, I tried all these things and I got it wrong, and I learned this and I tried that, and I got that wrong too, and I learned this and I tried that and it worked better. And the insights I got from it, it's, you know, it's not about getting it right, it's about... It's about reflecting, learning, growing, um, because that's how we get to be amazing leaders. And on top of that, all of these leader awards coming also had to write an excellent team proposal. And I have to tell you that the minimum mark that we got to even start looking at this was a 96% score. So that was how good and how hard it was to actually um, work out who we were even going to look at. And then we sent 15 out to be checked. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't easy, I can tell you. Um, so Brendan Mangente from Alliant International University in the USA her team did a project on e-bike rental for Cam uh, Cambodia, and they had this clip-on that you could rent the clip-on that went onto bicycles to make it um, uh, present. So Ben Power Smith, in, in virtual reality, can you come and collect this award on behalf of a renter, please? Because she wasn't going to make it to Parliament in New Zealand. Sarah French, who was going to make it to Parliament uh, today, her proposal was a from home one. And they were, they were taking single mothers in Nigeria and they were helping them to learn all these IT skills so that they could get part of that global market of being able to, to work from home and get much better revenue than they could uh, in their, their own township. So um, congratulations to Sarah. Sophie Isles also was going to turn up today. Um, her project was the Little Academy one. Um, so she was, who, they were looking at Thailand. There's 71 local languages in Thailand. And they were looking at how they were, could pay the royalties for eBooks, but be able to have a, from the app that could translate some of these children's books into the local languages by the teachers or others in the schools. And so to make learning available in local languages, as well as in English, uh, for their, um, um, their children. So Emma Rose Fryer, we were looking forward to seeing you today. So uh, another one of our star performers, Emma. Um, so Petra Kati from Kathmandu University of Management in Nepal. A lot of these Nepali students stepped up and were leaders. And as I said, they're truly, truly, they're a remarkable country. I can't begin to tell you how extraordinary the Nepalis are. They, they um, you just never see them complain and yet yet they are remarkable they're creative they're problem solvers they're humble they're leaders and so Petra Khatri was just one of the gems of the gems she was truly amazing and apparently and I didn't know this that people produce these um, uh, flowers that they take to the temples and they rot and there's this big massive uncleaned mess around the temples of rotting flowers but if you can take these flowers, you can do things to convert them into dyes. So Romana Jennings, um, my virtual invite to you is another star performer to collect on behalf of your um, of this Nepali leader. Um, Trey, you've just heard from Trey. Congratulations, Trey. You have won a Global Leader Award for your team's proposal, BioLite. Um, that was the portable biogas digester 
for Nigeria. Oh, there's mum in the background and dad. I'm so pleased to see you. Welcome, kia ora to you. Uh, congratulations. Trey, if you want to speak, you'll probably, um, the, the, it'll flip to you and the, and the family. Do you want to speak now? Uh, yes, sure. Well, um, I've already given you my thanks, Deb, so um, I don't think I should do that again. But um, honestly, I feel quite guilty being up here by myself. You know, um, you know, I, my team put in most of the effort there and, you know, I just, I just wish they could be here to accept this with me as well. So, Can we see yes. mum and dad as well, please? Um, no, it's, it's like a camera, it's, it pans out when someone comes in the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> dog. Hello, congratulations, mother. I gather you've had a very, very long journey all the way down to Wellington almost and now all the way back again. So your son's a star. So um, and I'm pleased you managed to make it back and find a computer to talk to us. So. Oh, yeah, that's all good. Yeah, no, yeah, very proud of him. And yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So this was a, um, a portable biogas digester for Nigeria. So uh, Global Leader Award goes to Gray Ryburn for aqua tanks, uh, self-chlorinating water tanks for Uganda. It was a stunning um, uh, oh, reflection. It just had us in tears and insight and feeling how he felt. And so I'm going to share those on, on um, jibas.org. Uh, when we update it all and have a read of it, it's an absolute stunner. So, Gray, congratulations on, on winning this award. So, Virginia Cathro, she was flying up to Wellington from Dunedin, uh, 79 Otago students, and she just was stepping onto the plane when it was like, uh oh, this is not a good idea. So, she's back in Dunedin. So I said to her, well, um, so she's now stuck trying to be able to access us. So I'm speaking on her behalf. And she said, you know, I, this week she said, I spoke to three of our students who did this contest in the past and had taken some uh, role. And they said, we've got jobs and our confidence in the job, our ability to get the job and to do it is entirely uh, because of doing this contest. It is a hugely important thing for them, she said, in terms of um, employability and the skills to be able to do it. So virtually, Virginia, thank you very much for all of your leadership of all these Otago students and the numbers who stepped up into leadership roles. So the um, University of Otago Business School are the sponsors for the Global Peer Leader Award. And so these are team members who um, received, again, glowing feedback from teammates. They had an insightful reflection um, about what does it take to step into that role to be able to support your leader, but to lead. Um, that they had a quality team proposal. If they didn't do good work, it wasn't worth anything. And they either shown as a peer lead for one of three reasons. One of the leaders invited them to lead. Or the team leader fell over or got sick or got COVID or family members died or, um, you know, a lot of tragedies are going on out there. Uh, mental breakdowns for various reasons why folks uh, could no longer lead. And these people went, oh, my word, who's going to do it? It's got to be me. And they stepped up to in, into that. Um, and then there's the ones who excelled despite some really tough personal challenges. So there's different ways that, that people shone in this award. To a certain extent, uh, you could do better in this award, uh, award if um, you were in a team where the team leader didn't uh, thrive. Most teams were brilliant, but not all of them. So who's won this award? Well, the first winner is Anusha Banerjee, who's living in Dubai, but studying in the United Kingdom. And her project was Easy Flow about cloth sanitary pads for India. And she happened to be one of the ones that stepped up because the team uh, had a leader who failed to fire. So Eduardo Diaz was going to collect on, on behalf of Anusha, but congratulations to, to, uh, to Anusha for, for winning that award. Uh, Ferdinand Benti from the Netherlands. Now we had 180, I think, from the Netherlands. In every team, there was a Dutch team member. They've got a magnificent academic who leads the program. Um, and they um, absolutely reliable, the, the, the Dutch, that um, 
uh, but in this team, the um, the team leader um, uh, got into trouble. So he stepped up and they created this Green Stars project for a hostile competition for voluntary cleanup for uh, a tourism areas uh, in Thailand. So this was about creating a business about building, enabling people to meet each other and join and have the fun and make a difference um, in Thailand. Great concept. And again, his leader burnt out. So he stepped up into that role and he was left kind of stranded going, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And you know, I can't tell you how the courage it takes when you aren't automatically given the leader role and yet you step up. So uh, Nico van Udenaren was going to connect on his behalf. So um, um, the next winner of this award is Katharina Tateri from the University of Otago. And she had a project called Milk Soap and she understood about how New Zealand's got the far and away the biggest uh, export of uh, dairy in the world. We um, enormous exporters of it. And yet tucked in there is a lot of waste of that milk. So she's looking at repurposing that milk waste into soap. So she was invited to be a co-leader by Mirabel Gu, who was the leader. She saw the talent of Katarina and asked her if she'd be a co-leader. And they were an absolutely powerful, unstoppable team. Uh, the next winner is Matteo Longoni, who's from Italy. And they had a project called Scrap. And this is an app looking at the CO2 footprint based in the United States of America. And again, he had to step up when his leader was facing a major personal crisis. So, you know, that courage is extraordinary, really. It's not, not an easy thing to do. So Selena Wang um, was one of our star performers who was going to collect on behalf of Matteo. Um, and then the, the um, uh, peer leader award, Shashank Ray from India, uh, on the project Fuel for All, um, looking at repurposing excess food from hotels and restaurants in Delhi, India. Um, so Shashank's father died from COVID on the first day of this contest. And we were hearing from people in India just the, the heartbreak and the tragedy and the, the, the how difficult it was to get any support. And he wrote and he said, look, I don't believe I can be a good enough team member I have so much grief. And we wrote back and said, it's up to you if you choose to continue or not. Um, but it's also up to the team to be here and being a loving support for you. That's part of being a GM team member is that you support your colleagues. And so he decided to stay on. And my gosh, he was just such a powerful team member there. So Pradeep Kaur was going to connect on behalf of Shashank. And then the winner of the Global Peer Leader Award is Clarissa Gernt, who's from the Netherlands, one of these 180 remarkable students that we had uh, from the Netherlands. And they were looking at Malermo PAP sources. And they had some team members from South Africa who said, well, everybody eats um, this kind of a porridge PAP stuff, but it doesn't taste that good, really. And so they were wondering how they could get more nutrition into the diets. And so they were looking at using um, um, moringa tree as one of the sources to be able to get nutrition into it and making a profitable business out of it. And so one of the clever things they looked at was how to get adoption and diffusion and build from a small base and to be successful. So Clarissa was invited to be a co-lead by her leader of her team, Summer Pritchard, and Summer was going to collect on behalf of her teammate, Clarissa. So huge admiration to all of our co-leaders. Do you know, we had around about um, 80 or 90 people step up. Some were invited and some step up into these co-leader roles. Um, and they were just remarkable, absolute powerhouses really, really impressive. So now I want to pass on to my colleague, uh, Monet Mayo, who led the coaching program. And uh, so Monet, I'll pass on to you and, and uh, you've got power over the, uh, the all the buttons there, I believe. All right, good. Um, just Trey, if you can hear me, I chatted to your coach, Joel Arcus. Uh, he said to send a message your way, he said, Trey, I could not be more proud of you and what you've accomplished in the G2021. You took your mission and purpose to heart with a plan and your accolades are well-deserved. Well done, Trey. I look forward to hearing 
about you and your endeavors in the years to come. I know you will go very far. Thank you. All right. Um, a management guru, Peter Drucker, famously once said, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And he's quite famous for that. And he's quite famous for, for um, the work that he did in management consulting through the years. After that, a, a chap named Lawrence Miller, who was another management consultant, added to what Peter said. And he said, culture eats capability for lunch. But what does this all really mean? At the interplay between strategy and capability and culture in organizational settings, it's culture that largely influences whether anything gets done at all. Culture is to a team what mindset is to an individual. At the core of every organization is the team. It's everywhere, from the board to the C-suite, uh, all the way through to the team that takes care of the customer, the supplier, or any of the other stakeholders that organizations work with. Organizational teams are by nature artificial groupings of people that have incredible capabilities residing within each te individual team member. However, the ability of the team to deliver their collective capability is heavily influenced by how the team members relate to each other. Uh, in other words, their team culture. So how can we help teams to intentionally create healthy cultures that unlock their collective capability? Well, the answer is coaching. Advances in neuroscience over the last two decades have revolutionized our understanding of the human brain and how best to engage with it. Coaching applies this growing body of knowledge into a practical interpersonal facilitation process. Uh, it's become the gold standard method for facilitating lasting positive change in individuals and teams and organizations. This year, the G accepted 60 enrollments into its 2021 leader coach training program. While most of us were New Zealanders, um, many of us were scattered around the world. Only three of us had any prior experience with coaching and we were all total strangers to each other. We trained up online over a total period of eight weeks with 44 coaches participating finally in the practical leader coaching phase. Uh, it was at this point that we divided into seven random teams um, and took on the challenge of facilitating high performance team cultures in our team settings. We did so using our coaching skills while at the same time delivering coaching sessions to G team leaders. The results speak for themselves. Our coaching teams ultimately exceeded all of the course requirements and went on to deliver a total of more than 500 one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions into the G. To top it all off, most of our teams tell us that they want to continue indefinitely and form sustainable coaching communities. The G team leaders we coached reported personal impacts ranging from very helpful to profoundly transformational and even life-changing. Some of them credit coaching with saving their sanity and allowing them to compete the, in the, complete the G at all. Uh, and from what Trey said, uh, the caffeine addictions were rife everywhere. To my coaches, let me assure you that lives that you touched, uh, the work that you did in the G will echo into the future. You have my admiration and my gratitude. My experience of working with you in the G was quite incredible. I consider myself privileged to have had this opportunity. I am so sorry <laughs> that it's come to an end. I hope, however, that your journey has just started and that you choose to keep going. Thank you. To, I, I get my further privilege to acknowledge some of the coaches for their outstanding achievements. Um, we had a couple of things going on in the coaching program to, to uh, provide just a little bit of competition. Um, the, one of the first categories that uh, the coaches competed in was in the top team coach award. Now, this is for this is award for the coach within each team that delivered the most coaching sessions on behalf of that team during the G. For the A team, the winner of the top team coach award is Donna Jayamane. 
she created, she got 12 sessions, coaching sessions under the belt. Fantastic work there, Donna. For the Trailblazers team, Heather Graves takes the honors with 13 sessions, coaching sessions. Well done there, Heather. For the Curiosity crew, um, Angus Allen, 12 sessions. 12 sessions for Angus. Angus, well done. He's always sitting all the way in the UK. Um, for the Dynamic Daring Dreamers, Joel Arcus, 24 sessions. <laughs> that is quite a total of coaching that he put into the G. Well done, Joel. Joel is sitting in South Africa, and I hope that he's actually taking a look at, at, what, uh, at this webinar tonight. For Team Extraordinary, the top coach is Fenella Brown, 28 sessions. What an effort, a fantastic effort into the G. That is three times more than what was required in terms of uh, meeting her expectations for the course. Fenella, extraordinary job. Um, for Team Focus Force, the winner there is Brittany Green with 14 coaching sessions delivered in the G. And finally, our last team is Team All G. Top coach there is Harita Gandhi for 16 sessions delivered in the G. Fantastic, Harita. Very well done. And I love that photo of you. I don't know how you guys got that photo, but that's fantastic. <laughs> Congratulations to all of the top coaches in each of the teams. Well done. Uh, you've done a great job. And I'm sure that your efforts were felt inside of the G all the way through. The next award is for the top overall coach. And if you, you, you might have guessed it from just if you can do the mathematics, the person that takes that award is Fenella Brown. Um, Fenella, absolutely fantastic job. Those 28 sessions, a monster effort. Um, I know what it cost you to, to do that. And it was all voluntary that you did. I can hear the clapping in the background. Uh, lots of people celebrating. Absolutely fantastic job. Well done. The next award is for the most valued member of the team. This is an award that's given by a team to an individual team member in the team for their commitment and their support to the rest of the team members. Teams actually nominate and vote for their most valued member internally. So for each of these teams, for the A team, the most valued member is Kayla Crossman. Congratulations, Kayla. Very well done in that one. For Team Trailblazers, Yadzia, this is yours. You take the honors here. Well done. Um, for Team Curiosity Crew, Celeste Rosier. Celeste, I wish your name was popped up there on that PowerPoint slide, but I think it got mutilated uh, at some stage before the presentation. So sorry about that. That's Celeste that's uh, outlined in green there. For Team Dynamic Daring Dreamers, the the most valued member is Joel Arcus. Joel, fantastically well done. That's a clean sweep for you. Uh, and you, your team members love you apparently as well. So congratulations on that, Joel. I hope you're watching. Um, for Team Extraordinary, Kimberly Harkirken took the Most Valued Member Award. Congratulations, Kimberly. Uh, very well done on that one. Uh, you supported everybody, and I think you just made sure that uh, everybody stayed optimistic. I loved your smile in that team. You were just irrepressible. Um, for Team Focus Force, the top or the most valued member is Rihanna Callahan. Well done, Rihanna. Uh, your team loved what you did, and they, they found your support fantastic. Thank you for what you did for that team. Finally, the last team is all G and the uh, most valued member there voted in again, Harita Gandhi. Congratulations, Harita. Very well done. A clean sweep, just like with Joel. So <laughs> congratulations. You, you must have stuck in a lot of effort to, to make that happen. Our final award uh, is the top coaching team award. Now, our coaching teams competed against each other in this particular case. The top coaching team award goes to the team that's managed to deliver the most coaching hours in the three week period of the G and the one week after the G. It was a mighty battle with, for the best possible cause in helping the team leaders. 
And none of the teams, coaching teams actually knew exactly how many hours the other teams had managed to accrue during the course of the contest. It's time to reveal the winner. I know that the, co the teams are waiting for this one. Ladies and gentlemen, the top coaching team for the G2021 is Team Extraordinary. 93 sessions. What a fantastic accomplishment and a, an enormous job done by that team. Team Extraordinary is Catherine Johnson, Fenella Brown, Hans Gulich, that's sitting in Thailand, uh, Kimberly Harkirkel, she, she's Harkirken, she is in New Zealand, Tijal Ladd is in Fiji, William Spencer is in New Zealand, and I just forgot to mention that Fenella Brown was in Australia, but has come all the way back to Wellington. She was going to join us here for the award ceremony uh, and is now just joining us online. I, in fact, Fenella's made such an effort to in the G in the coaching program and in coming to Wellington to join us here that um, I've asked her to say a couple of words. She didn't know that she was the recipient of the Top Coach Award and she didn't know that Team Extraordinary was the winner of the Top Coaching Team Award either. So it's quite fortuitous that Fenella's agreed to come and talk to us about the coaching experience. Right. <laughs> Lucky for everybody else. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, yes, no, I didn't know about that. So <laughs> um, it's, that's super exciting. And um, yeah, it's so, it's so cool to see all of the, all of the coaches and everything that we've achieved and, um, and even seeing those, those team um, leaders awards and seeing lots of names that um, I've personally coach and had conversations with and um yeah it's super exciting and yeah feeling feeling very proud of a lot of people right now actually <laughs> um so yes as Monet said I have been um handed the <laughs> the um job of just kind of saying a little something on behalf of our coaching team um so I I've never felt comfortable as a leader and while I was always someone who kind of fall into these leadership roles growing up, I didn't feel comfortable in them and I didn't actually enjoy them that much. Um, I mean, I think it was because I was, I was very worried about being perceived as being bossy or, or arrogant or too young and experienced. Um, so to me, leadership was just a means of kind of stepping up to get something done. That was until I met Monet and Inelda. I thought an eight-week coaching leadership course, online modules, you know, a few night classes, great, easy, easy, no. <laughs> Challenging, yes. Confronting, rewarding, life-changing. Um, the first class we were told, leaders don't give advice. What? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> leaders don't give advice. I mean, surely, surely that's the entire point, right? No, leaders don't give advice. And in fact, leadership is not about you at all. Being a leader is about empowering others to explore their own thinking, listening with intent to understand and then guiding them to choose their own action. And that's exactly what we did as coaches for the students leading these G projects. We became their support system, their sounding ear. We asked questions, lots of questions, and I'm sure... <laughs> That was probably frustrating for um, a lot of the leaders at the time who were just looking for that answer. I mean, our, our questions challenged them and, and often sometimes were confronting. But we didn't give them answers and we didn't give them advice. Instead, we allowed them to think through their problems and come up with answers on their own. It's facilitating this, you know, self-generated discovery because that's where the true development comes from. And that was our role. It got me thinking though, how could I have got this idea of leadership so wrong? And then it dawned on me. The reason I didn't understand what it meant to be a leader is because I've never had one. For the entirety of my career, I've only had managers who had kind of fallen into these roles based on seniority. Um, you know, this, they'd been in the business long enough that that was their natural progression into a management role. Yet none of these people were leaders. They weren't there to develop me or they or challenge me. They were there for themselves and I was there to help them do their job. 
in eight weeks, I've gone from somebody who actively avoided leadership roles to now changing my entire career path in pursuit of becoming a leader. I want to be the leader that I never had. I want to grow and develop young people and empower them to find their potential. Because really, it's this kind of leadership that creates these, these high-performing tea cultures in, in organizations or um, anywhere outside of that. So thank you again to um, everyone involved in this um, project. Mone, Anauda, Deb, you guys are, um, yeah, <laughs> we bow down to you guys. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and on behalf of all of um, all of the coaches, this has been a pretty phenomenal experience and, and one that will sit with us for a very, very long time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fenella. You're an absolute star. And you know, I know I've been reading the lives that you've changed in some of these reflections. So what you've done has mattered a lot. So it's truly brilliant. So now I'd like to uh, take us to the, um, the winning proposals. I mean, these, this is what these students and, and, and the mentor students, we had 86 organizations, people in organizations participate as well. And Jane Bryson wasn't able to be at Parliament tonight. And it turns out, nor were any of us. So, um, but I was speaking on her behalf. I teach at Victoria University, um, only just on contract, just this one course for these students. So what's a business concept proposal? It was what we're looking for is could you take this proposal and make others believe so it's going to be written really well and really insightful and really good economics. Others believe that you can make a difference, make a profit, and make it happen and do it on a sharing. That's what we, we were looking at in these proposals. So let's take us through the top six, the ones that were the winning ones. Our Chancellor of Victoria University, Neil Pavois-Smith, uh, was to be handing out these awards to you this evening and speak briefly, but, um, you know, did I mention COVID? Something about that has happened tonight. So, the highly commended team proposals. The first thing goes to Team 9 for this Warner Flora dye. And I talked to you before about the waste flowers, that they were taking the rotting flowers and turning them into dye. And this team had members, see the top two names there, they were co-leaders who stepped up to lead this team. Um, no New Zealanders in sight in this one, Nepal, Nigeria, Netherlands, Indonesia, another Nepali and two from China. And Liam Murphy was going to collect on behalf of this team. Team 95 was Mag Meal Farm. This is the black soldier fly maggots for poultry in Nigeria. Um, chickens love it, apparently. Um, Caitlin Ebert was the leader of this team from New Zealand, Nigeria, Netherlands, Thailand, Hong Kong, Colombia, Indonesia, and Hong Kong. And they had three weeks loving what they could find out about maggots in Nigeria. Um, team 130, Moringa Care. So the Moringa tree provides this nutritional pow um, powder. It can grow very well in, in, in Africa. It's hugely nutritious. And this was intriguing. This project was selling it not just into the Kenyan refugee camps, but to the refugees to make a business for themselves, selling it in the camps. And people were saying, are you sure? that refugee camps have, you know, have any kind of autonomy. Well, in the camp they were looking at, there are 2,700 registered businesses in Kenya. Masses and masses of talent. And many of these people are warehoused for 40 years. So actually providing the opportunity for people inside the camp to make a business was an important thing too. So this was um, led by Liam in New Zealand. Gita uh, stepped up as a co-leader from Netherlands. Uh, Brianna came from Otago in New Zealand, Bangladesh and Malaysia. So um, Caitlin Smith and Greta Brown were flying up to Wellington from Dunedin. Um, I don't know whether they ended up as far as Christchurch or Wellington, but um, at any rate, we kind of pushed them to the tail end because they were going to have to run from the airport to a uh, collect this award on behalf of the 79 Otago students who were truly brilliant. 
The next one was Team 141, Preg Easy. And this was a safe birthing kit for Rwanda. Uh, Samantha Ainsley led this team for, from New Zealand with colleagues from the United Kingdom, Indonesia, Nepal, uh, New Zealand again, and Kenya. Um, and this was so that um, they, they found a very clever way of being able to market this in a way that was profitable, but use the existing systems as much as possible to get it to the women who needed it. Team 152, highly commended for milk soap, repurposing New Zealand's milk waste into soap. So Mirabel Gu led this team from New Zealand, huge support from Katharina Tathiri from Otago, uh, and other team members who, who completed everything from Nigeria, Germany, and China. So you can see there's six in there. I mean, this is six is actually good to get to the end of this contest. They start with eight, and many of these teams you'll see ended up with actually all eight of them. Uh, quite remarkable. And so who is the champion team? It's team 123 for BioLite, which is a portable biogas digester for Nigeria. And these, the guys in Nigeria, so Abalaji Kahinda Matthew, he and his friends said, well, let's build and design one of these things and find an affordable way of doing it. It's not all stainless steel and expensive. Um, really, really doable project driven by true social entrepreneurs. So Trey, you know, you and your team from New Zealand, Netherlands, Nigeria, Thailand, Nepal, South Africa, and Malaysia, uh, congratulations. And I pass on to you the Chancellor's uh, handshake, uh, the Minister's handshake. Um, the Minister would have had his exercise tonight. He would have jumped up and down at least 20 times tonight shaking hands. Um, but uh, so tremendous congratulations. And then there's one final award, and this is sponsored by my husband, who's a retired E. He was a former chair of the management group at Victoria University. He was a consultant on international innovation and organizational development. And many of us said, hey, Deb, you know, you've got 168 amazing proposals. What are you doing with them? I said, well, nothing. We're growing leaders and people who can make ventures happen. But then we realized, no, we really do need to provide the money and the incentive for everybody to say, what would I do? What would I do to make it happen? Um, so we created this $4,000 seed venture capital fund. Um, and it was an option for one individual to say, I'm going to take this, pro this proposal and I'm going to make it happen. And some of them said, look, I'm going to make it happen in my country instead of the one it was developed for, fine. So the 140 people said, I want to make this happen. And so we assessed this on two criteria. To what extent was it a really great doable project? And to what extent did we get convinced with, we've got a 220 columns of data on the folks. To what extent do we now know that this particular person has the skills and the mindset and is at the right time of their life too, to drive it and make it happen? And the winner was, was quite resounding actually. It was from, Ozoagu Chizozi Stephen from Nigeria for his Magmeal Farm, team number 95. He had produced an 11 minute video and I've got to share it with you on, on, on uh, jeebus.org. Uh, he's tried out all the different rubbish bins to make this work. He's tried out all the different kinds of flies and feeds. He's tried out the different maggots. He's tried out the different chickens and what they want and what they want. He's tried out ways to get the uh, harvested. Um, he will make it happen. But intriguingly, he turned around to his team members and said, who, we only put the money into the company. They're going to set up a company and we put it in with a contract saying, make it happen. And he asked his colleagues, who will be a company director and who will make it happen? And the hands went up from Caitlin Ebert in New Zealand, who had led the team, and his colleagues from Hong Kong, Indonesia, Thailand, the Netherlands, and Colombia. So we expect enormous things. Please have a look on our website for this project and the others. Um, the ones from the three previous years, incredible stories of what they've done so far, transforming you know, food security in many parts of the world. So um, a huge uh, appreciation. And at this point, I would like to hand back to our minister um, and uh, some final comments, please.
Thank you, Deb, and thank you, everyone, and thank you particularly to those who shared uh, the stories of uh, how they've worked together as teams, some of the challenges they faced, and the inspiration uh, that others in the team um, gave them, you know, those stories of generosity about others, about them. Um, I want to leave you with, I guess, the challenge to think about how you keep the connections alive, um, the culture uh, eat strategy for breakfast message. How do you keep that culture alive? How do you keep those connections? Um, a really special project, a really special program. And uh, I, I um, like all of you, will need to, to move to our next commitment. But I, I just have really enjoyed this time. And I want to say thank you to all of you for the huge amount of volunteering you've done, uh, for the good and the difference this will make in the world. And I want to wish you all the very best. Thanks, Deb, and thanks everybody for the opportunity to be a part of recognising the really significant contributions that you have all made. Kia ora, Minister. Thank you very much. And thank you for the leadership you're providing us in this nation. Farewell. Kia ora.